Welcome to the Business Trendsetter Podcast, where we talk about trends and how to use them to grow your business. My name is Manny Turan. And I'm Adam Bartout. We're Spark Partners. We're here every week talking about trends, talking about lots of things related to business. And one of our favorite subjects is that of, well, second to trends, of course, is the idea of planning. And the way that we see planning is perhaps a, a little or a lot different than some other folks who talk about this term of strategic planning. My experience with that uh, term is uh, when I was at a corporate uh, company a number of years ago, a big company, and uh, it was like every year they went to the shelf and they got that old tome that was dusty. They t- dusted it off and I asked, well, what's that? And they said, that's our strategic plan. And every year <laughs> they just dust it off and they, they go through the process of, of uh, what happened. Um, mainly about 80% of it was looking backwards, about... Uh, 10% of it mm-hmm. was looking right now, and then 10% was looking in the future. And we'll get into mm-hmm. how we see things, but let's start off with the conversation regarding NVIDIA and how they do strategic planning, how they do planning in general. And this is off the heels of, a, of an article that we, uh, mm-hmm. we uncovered. And uh, so let's start there, Adam. Let's talk about NVIDIA and how they do things a little bit the Spark mm-hmm. Partners way. Well, what I liked about the article I read, and I believe it was from the New York Times that we were discussing, was that uh, the the leader of NVIDIA doesn't say strategic planning as being an annual exercise, nor does he see you create, I say, a five-year plan. For him, the world's a very fast-moving place. So what he really says is you have to be strategic planning every single day. That in reality, you've got to be looking externally at what's happening in the world, looking internally at where you place your resources, and then every day you make decisions based upon where, what you have to invest in to try to achieve the future. And and he sees the strategic, what we would call a strategic plan. He said he then throws the term out the window and says he doesn't have strategic planning. But what we would call the strategic planning process becomes one that, that's a consistent part of the decision-making process. Correct. So that as you're trying to make decisions, you're not trying to base it upon your past customers, your past investments, that kind of thing, you know? And that's important because if you look like right now, NVIDIA's got way out in front of AMD and Intel, which is kind of amazing because Intel was once like this great, unbelievably great company. And, you know, it was Intel chips that birthed the uh, the, the, the microprocessor and then birthed the, the whole personal computer revolution. Right. But Intel was this just deeply admired company. And then Next, second to them was AMD, and then you had Motorola at one time in that business. Motorola eventually dropped out. But Intel deeply loved the company, and now NVIDIA slung right past them. And, and what we see is that the, this, this, the, the leadership there, with their own sort of Steve Jobs kind of a leader, what he's saying is, look, I, I didn't build my company based upon trying to compete in the technology of the past, but rather looking forward. And he saw the need for these really super, super fast processors in order to, to do new tasks, and like cryptocurrency, for example, uses super, super fast, really hot processors. But he also came up and, and saw early on that he could do machine learning much better, which got us to the world of artificial intelligence. Right. Well, I think the, the real backdrop here is that what the, the founder of NVIDIA, uh, you know, Jason Huang, saw was uh, really latched on to some trends, right? He saw the writing on the wall with, with AI and machine learning. He saw the writing on the wall with the decline of the personal computer the way we know it. I mean, the, the desktop and all that. And I think that they made the right decisions. And I really like the way he is constantly and continuously planning and adjusting. And I think that's the backdrop of today's podcast is the idea of, of uh, folks and companies that are adapting and those that are maladapting or, or maybe not, maybe struggling with that process. And we have a couple of those uh, companies like Tesla, like Walmart, like Walgreens that we talked about here that are kind of on the ropes or kind of going through some uh, some changes that are perhaps difficult. So, Adam, well, yeah, give I us would your, agree. You know, yeah. one of the things... Go ahead. Well, one of the things that um, the article brought up was that the NVIDIA organization was very flat and the CEO has 40 direct reports. And one would kind of be led by this journalist down the road of thinking, oh, so really high performing organizations to get their 
what you do is you create a flat organization and get rid of the hierarchy. Well, yes, that's true. And I think that hierarchy does get in the way of innovation and being able to be successful. And I say that because if you take the idea of, of ideas and you start with 100 ideas and you go one level of hierarchy, well, everybody's got to get rid of at least half of what they've been told to do, right? So you, you go from 100 to 50 in one one layer of, of, of review. Go to another layer of review and you're down to 25. Three layers of review and you're down to 12 and a half. Four layers of review, you're down to six. Five layers of review, you're down to three. So the hierarchy does get in the way of innovation because people feel compelled to add their value by cutting back. So it, it, I don't like hierarchy for that reason. It does get in the way of innovation. It does get in the way of adaptability. But just getting rid of hierarchy doesn't make any sense unless everyone has a good, strong sense of the future. Now, again, I think why it's working at NVIDIA is that the leadership does have a very, very strong sense of what the future will look like. And they're able to, to tell the people in the organization, this is where we're going. And then people have the ability to work individually and in small teams towards a common goal. We saw this, for example, at Apple when Steve Jobs was running the company, especially in the comeback after 2000. What he did was he was like, we're going after mobile. And everybody in the company understand this, we're going after mobile. And you can flack the organization then because there's a clear sense of what we're trying to do and how you know the marketplace, the customers, the people can say, my job is to be better at working. My job is to be better at sales. My job is to be better at uh, technology. My job is better at manufacturing. But we all know where we're headed, right? We have this clear view of the future. And that, that's what they have at NVIDIA. And you can get to a flat organization that way. Um, what I see most of the time, though, is people don't have that clear sense of the future, right? They you haven't know. done the scenario planning. They haven't brought the trends in. They haven't looked out into the future and said, hey, what is it that we're headed towards and that we could tell everybody this is the direction? Because if you have that, then everybody can not they can self-place, but also when they get together in groups, they can, they're chatting it up. They can say, I feel like I'm headed in the right direction. And they get feedback from their peers as to whether or not they're headed yeah. in the right direction. They don't yeah. constantly go to the boss to find out if it's right. That peers themselves can be a part of the regulatory system. Exactly. We call that the spaghetti strategy. Let's throw it on the <laughs> wall and see if it sticks. And uh, I was having a conversation with, with a friend of mine a few days ago, and uh, she was struggling and kind of talking about the company that she's working for. She's kind of like second in command. And uh, the main issue is that there was, there's just a lack of vision where, where you, when you know, what is the term? Uh, when you don't know where you're going, all roads will take you there, right? And, and they don't know where they're going. They kind of right. know they have a couple of really cool goals that they're pursuing, but there's not a general vision of what they're trying to accomplish. And then in that lack of vision, there is a, a vacuum of, of the, not only decision-making power, but just making decisions that are for the, the alignment of that goal. If you're not, if you don't know where you're going, then you're just making, you're just kind of haphazardly working on little micro goals. And I think a lot of leaders, whenever the subordinates are coming to them asking, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? They tend to take that as a, gee, I, I really have to, I have an incompetent team and I have to make decisions for everybody. And they become micromanagers. And the reality is they got the situation upside down. The reason people are asking, what do, what do you want me to do? Is because they don't know where you're headed. They don't have that sense of the, the future. They don't have the scenario in their head to know what they need to do to fulfill your goal as a leader. So they have to keep saying, well, I don't know what the goal is, like you said, where are we headed? And so I don't know what road to take. And so therefore, I'm constantly asking for reinforcement as to whether I'm doing the right thing. So people misinterpret the signals they're getting from their own organization. Um, and, and again, it's not, you know, the strategic plan shouldn't be this annual event that we sit down and say, this is where it's ended, but rather it should be, this is our view of the future. And then the second part of that becomes now the discussion sh should be shifting from what do you want me to do to a discussion about what does the marketplace want? So that if I'm if you're a leader and somebody comes in and says, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you for input on what do you want me to do? You should be able to say, well, what is it our customers want? What does the future look like? And has something changed? Do we have new input? And, you know, does this change our view of the future? Should we update our scenarios now that we've got some new input here? Uh, that that's a much richer conversation than let's make a decision. Exactly. Uh, where there was once a line by a former president of the United States where he said, you know, I'm the chief decision maker or something to that point. And I always just hated it because he was a graduate of the Harvard Business School. And he made it sound like the role of a leader is to make decisions. 
I think occasionally that's true. Uh, but most of the time, really, they're all leaders. So make sure you've got all the right information that you're bringing. The doors are open for external information to be coming in. And then your organization is processing that external information, leading it towards good resource allocation. So it's really your job is less about being a decision maker and more like being a, a, an orchestra leader. Yeah. You so know, bringing in, together the right people with the right music and then making it get the best out of it. Exactly. In my role as a CEO of this company, IR Labs, that I've mentioned, um, I my job description to myself is two sentences. Pretty simple. The first is to set and execute on the vision of the company. Who are we? Who are customers? What do they want? Like getting us all rowing in the same direction. That's number one. Number two, block and tackle. That's it. That means providing the right resources. That means creating the right pathways for our customers to communicate with us. Basically clearing any roadblock that's holding us back from the first one, which is executing in our vision. Yeah. So uh, I mean, an example of this we can think about is a, kind of a big play is what's happening with the electrical grid. I've been telling people now for a couple of years that down the road, a decade, 20 years in the future, electricity is going to be free. Like, they look at me like I'm in Nathan. But the reality is when we all first got uh, cell phones, we paid by the minute to use the cell phone. When we first started doing data on our mobile devices, we paid by the minute or by the megabyte for uh, the amount of data we used. Today, we don't do that. Today, we pay a flat amount depending upon what, what service you use. And right. then you have access to the system. And then it doesn't matter where you are. Like in the old days, you had to be using, you know, if you were an AT&T customer, you had to talk to other people from AT&T and everything's on AT&T Tower. Now you go anywhere in the world. You know, I can take my mobile phone with me to Thailand and Philippines and, you know, um, Hong Kong and, and, and France. And it, it works everywhere. Well, why is that true? Because now what happens is everything's a big giant grid and you sign into the grid and you pay a flat rate to be on it. That's where electricity is headed. There's plenty of electricity out here. We know that there are solar farms ready to tie into the system. There are all kinds of solar, wind, and other renewable energy processes that are there. Um, some of them are fully built. Some of them are in the process of getting started. But the biggest issue is getting the permitting in place to get these things connected up as a grid. Because the old system was have a big generator, and then you have transmission lines, and then you have the consumer. Well, grid system doesn't work that way. Instead of, you know, me saying, well, if I'm if I'm in... In, in, in LA, then I would want to have you know, the closest power, which might come from a wind farm that's you know just outside of LA or from a solar panel system that's set up in suburban LA. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to be trying to get electricity from Nevada that's being sent all the way to LA and, and then losing 70% of it in the trans loss of transmission. So what happened though is the permitting made it very difficult to create these grids. Well, the people that are at this for a long time have been saying, forget about it, forget about it. The U.S. electric utilities keep saying, forget about it, forget about it. Why? Well, because as a utility, they like this grid. They like the current system. They like the fact that they can charge you whatever electricity they want to char charge for that electricity. But now the federal government's finally stepped in and changed the regulations. And they're saying, oh, okay, we're going to make permitting far, far easier for the grid system. And at this, in the same uh, piece of work done by the federal government, said, and by the way, it's going to be much, much more difficult to get permits around any kind of coal extraction, coal moving, and, and operating the coal-fired electric utility plant. Now that switches it, right? So now what happens is if you, if your future scenario said, hey, look, eventually when we'll get these grids set up, you're ready to rock and roll because now we've changed the rule. The regulators have gotten out of the way. If you're a person who said, I'm going to wait because today I can't do it. I can't do a grid. I can't set up a grid. And people like Adam are talking to some futuristic bumbo jumbo. Then when the, suddenly the, the rules change, you're not ready. Now you have to create a whole new plan, right? Yep. And so it's important that people are sitting there saying, what's the likely outcome way out in the future? And then you look at the obstacles that were going to be in the way of getting there. And then you build your daily decision making and your resource allocation based upon what the world is you have today but headed with a clear eye as to where it's headed. Now we're headed much more, again, the grid is going to get built and we're going to be headed off in that direction. And it's getting going to get easier year after year after year. Yeah, a friend of mine runs a, an energy storage company, 
based in Italy with operations in North Carolina. And I mean, he's working on that day in, day out. It's a, it's a sort of a wild west right now is, you know, you've got the, the renewables and how do you store the electricity when it's not, when there's not any sun or, or no wind and how do you shift it around? Can you create microgrids? Can you do arbitrage or uh, fill these batteries up when there's not people using it and then deplete them when they are? And I think there's a huge, huge impetus for that kind of technology. And uh, I think it's going to be a lot of money to be made if you're able to lock into that. Yeah. So again, when we get back to thinking about how we're doing our planning, uh, another example of a big mistake, uh, Walgreens, you might remember, was a big investor in Theranos, that uh, product that never existed and never got built. And but part of that was part of their goal towards having uh, Walgreens become a clinic where you would go into the location and you could get all kinds of clinical procedures. You can you know, view it as a doctor's office, let's say, without a particular doctor there. It could be a doctor on call using telehealth, et cetera. Well, anyway, Walgreens is shutting down almost all of its clinics now, signa $6 billion write-off. Walmart got the same idea in 2023. They came along and said that the future of Walmart was going to be down the road towards having a, a clinic in, in or near every Walmart store. So that uh, you know, ninety some percent of the population is within a ten minute drive of Walmart. So they're going to be able to get health services to everybody in the country, and it was going to be their big plan. Twenty twenty three. Well, they just announced they're going to shut all the clinics. They're all going to go away. And the guy running it said, "Yeah, well, it turns out we were wrong, and we can't make any money at this." So what happened? Well, you know, what went wrong here? Well, they they sat down and they tried to figure out how do I go forward and build a business plan that was going to make money immediately. In a very complicated healthcare system, and they they misjudged how you would do that, right? They, they, yes. It's not that people there is a need for healthcare, especially for the typical Walmart customer, the demographic of a typical Walmart customer. They are getting minimal healthcare, uh, and so there's a need. It's a poorly met need. But instead of saying how would the how what do we have to make happen in order for that need to be fully met? They said, I said, how do I take advantage of my Walmart stores? How do I take advantage of my customer to provide an immediate offering that is profitable? And by going at it that way, they, they were unable to find the, the let's call it the, what we used to call the secret sauce in order to make it work, right? So both Walgreens and, um, and, and, um, and Walmart have now failed at, at an opportunity because you know, if you look at it, Walmart has 6,000 vision centers. And they have um, a, a 3,500, no, I'm sorry, they have 3,500 vision centers and they have 6,000 pharmacies. Well, why? Because they're in vision centers, it's highly, it's not nearly as regulated. Very few people have insurance coverage for eye glasses. And so it, these are standalone facilities that they can operate towards profitability, not unlike a typical Walmart store. Right. And when it, when it comes to pharmacies, the rules are very, very well known, right? And so once again, they can focus on operational efficiency. So the old-fashioned business planning of how do I do it better, faster, cheaper works well for a Walmart. But when you have a system that you have to change, and you say, look, as an innovator, what I want to try to do is drive towards a future in which I see things operating differently, people behaving differently to, in order to get their needs met. Then you have to be way more flexible, right? You have to mm -hmm. be much more adaptable. You have to be able to say, I want to take one step, evaluate where I am, take a second step, evaluate where I am. I know what my vision is. I know what I'm trying to do. But each step along the way, I have to make sure that I'm resourcing and going in the right direction to make it happen. And if that means working on regulatory change, then you make a push on regulatory change. And, the key, and then, there again, use of the wrong sort of planning got them into trouble. Yeah. They tried to go do planning the way they planned store development for a Walgreens or a Walmart. And, of course, that wasn't the way that you're going to be able to be profitable at serving healthcare needs for people, uh, the demographic that are their customers. Right. You just remember how long Amazon was unprofitable, a full 20 yeah. years, right? Yeah. They were unprofitable for 20 That's years. Yeah. But they hung on. They believed in their vision. And I think that Walmart made a huge mistake. I think they should have, like you said, reformulated their how they actually performed their strategy mm -hmm. and not do it the same as Walmart sort of general or the core of Walmart. And they failed. And that, that's kind of a, um, it's a telltale to the limited vision. And I mean, they're not getting out of their box. They're still in the damn box and they're still thinking the same way. Yeah. So let's take, for example, you know, last week we beat up on, uh, on Tesla pretty bad and Elon Musk. But again, let's go back to 
his decision that he announced last week that he was going to um, go after the robo taxi business, right? And he'd maybe go after a smaller car, and that seemed to be part of his plan. But he really said, if you want to, if you want to be an investor in, in uh, Tesla, you should be sure because of the we're going to be doing fully autonomous cars and robo taxis. And the problem there was that we don't know what the unmet need is, right? We really don't. I mean, most people drive a car and they're reasonably happy to do it. They would like some driver assistance. And that, I mean, there's a, there's a pathway there, but we don't, it's not a clear pathway, even though people have been talking about it for 10 years. You've had Google, you've had Apple, you've had some very forward thinking companies that they're talking about autonomous cars, yet autonomous taxis, Waymo have not been successful. It's not a big business. You know, customers are clanging around, clamoring, or clamoring for you know uh, robotic taxis. So the, the need seems to be pretty well met today, and there's not a significant improvement in this. But at the same time, it is happening in trucks. Then the reason, so what's working there? Well, there's Aurora Innovations and there's Kodiak Robotics. What they said was, look, instead of trying to figure out how to make a car mobilize itself around the city of San Francisco, let's take a truck. A, a semi truck, which spends the vast majority of its miles on an interstate highway system. All right, if we could get it onto the interstate highway system and then have it drive itself for a long way, and then when it gets off the interstate highway system, maybe we put a driver back into it. Now, all of a sudden, we've simplified the problem dramatically, right? You don't have yeah. pedestrians wandering into the street, you don't have all the problems of an of urban or even a suburban environment. And so, you, 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 you've made the the proposition much better, which is drivers driving uh, uh, trucks for long distances eat up a lot of time. Drivers are limited how many hours a week they can drive the truck. And so, and then drivers struggle whenever they're doing over the road trucking because they're spending so many nights away from home. And that's costly and difficult. But if you say, hey, look, you can be a truck driver, you're going to be taking trucks to the interstate and then picking trucks up from the interstate and bringing them back into the city. You take away a lot of the negativity or the, of the job of being a truck driver. Meanwhile, the trucks themselves, which can operate on the interstate highway system without a driver, are being much more effective, right? So what they did was they really defined the need quite clearly on, in terms of what was where an autonomous truck would be valuable. And then they set out to come up with a solution that worked. And they're being very successful at it. They're already operating trucks in Texas or Florida. Uh, they're moving into Oklahoma. Uh, we've seen trucks operated. Uh, in Arizona uh, and Nevada, uh, up the highway, up the corridor towards Seattle. So it's working, right? Because what they did was they got really clear around what was the need and how they could fulfill the need, which was to replace or, or enhance the truck driver's job in such a way there would be more truck drivers and we wouldn't have this limitation and truck drivers could be more effective. The robo-taxi idea is just, you know, Musk is throwing it out there like we all need it. When it doesn't fly in the United States, what does he do? He gets on a plane and flies to China and tries to get the Chinese, and it meets with the Chinese premier and says, hey, look, uh, would you work with me on autonomous driving? And I'm sure his idea is, oh, here, I'm not going to get sued because they don't, have, <laughs> they don't yeah. have suits like we do in the United States. I've got a government that could just get behind me and I can, you know, I can, I can operate this without a lot of the difficulties that I have in the United States. And so even though there's no more apparent need for autonomous vehicles in China than there is in the U.S., he keeps looking for that market, right? He keeps saying, well, I've got, so what do we have? We have an innovator in search of a market rather than saying, what's the unserved need and how would I better serve that need, right? Yeah. So again, you know, you can figure out the right way to do it, like Aurora Innovation and Kodiak Robotics are doing with semi trucks, or you can go at it the wrong way, which appears to be the way that Tesla's going about it now. Yeah, I think that uh, maybe some of that robo taxi stuff is just uh, hand waving, as a result of the, the poor stock, um, you know, over the past six months, uh, and all these crazy decisions. I mean, getting rid of their charging stations, which was a potential, or the charging station group which was really, you know, the tip of the spear with sort of leading all the other uh, car companies to adapt to them. I mean, it just seemed like it was a good opportunity to make money, to make actually inroads in that space. Well, it was several weeks ago that we learned that the, um, the, the U.S. automakers had decided to band together. All of them were going to use the uh, Tesla system. They got rebranded as the North American uh, charging system. And it was like, this is great. Now, Tesla's going to make money 
selling electricity for electric cars to all electric cars, right? And this is going to become a standard. They're going to get a piece of the action on everything the customer does. Owning the infrastructure is always a good idea so that you're making money on everybody's uh, business. Think about Microsoft. They made more money in PCs than all the PC manufacturers combined. Why? Yep. Because they got that nugget with the operating system. They got that nugget with Office. So having that 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 operating system centrality, having control of that infrastructure was extraordinarily profitable and very, very successful for Microsoft for, for a couple of decades, right? So here you're looking at it like, oh, here you go. You've got the biggest uh, charging system in the United States. Tesla, you can build it out. You've got the most experience. You've locked down a lot of sites. You know how to identify sites. You know how to put up the stations. You know how, you've got the software in place to link them together. You've got the software to link them to the customers. I mean, all kinds of the problems you need to solve are there. Customers, one of the probably the biggest issue still today is range anxiety for EV buyers. They're afraid they're going to get somewhere and won't be able to charge up. Whereas these Tesla chargers could operate at 350 kilowatts, which means that you could fully charge a car in about an hour. You know, even if you've been driving at 300 miles and you pretty much run out of range, you could charge the thing in an hour. So this was like, I mean, it was, it was a brilliant strategy to get into this business in the first place, to grow the business and to be in a position to continue to expand the business. And I even had a tactical plan for how to do everything from buy the parts to assemble them to then have um, installers that they didn't, that they hired rather than trying to control all the installers out in the field like the old fashioned phone company used to do. So you even got the tactical plan all worked out. And then Musk decides this week, oh, we're just going to cancel that. And he shuts the whole thing down and lays everybody off. Why? Because he wants he wants to save money, cost controlled, because he can't sell all the cars he has. We went over that last week. And whatever money he has going to invest, he's going to put into robo taxis. So here's an innovator. I'd say an animator gone wild. Instead of thinking about how do I manage the business as well as innovate, how do I grow when I create yeah. an innovation, how do I maximize its value? He's sort of like, oh, I did that. Let's go do something else now without thinking about the implications that, that are involved here. And that's really, really unfortunate. Right. You know, I mean, at this point, he's left. Now he's leaving the door wide open. BMW and Mercedes and a handful of other companies uh, have joined together to create a consortium that they want to go after Tesla. Um, there's going to be companies now that will be able to jump up and say, okay, we're going to get into the business in a bigger way because we don't have to compete with Tesla. And you're going to see m uh, people getting into the maintenance business in a much bigger way so that they can try to take on the maintenance of the Tesla chargers as well as maintenance of all the other chargers that are out there. So what he's done is he's opened the door wide open for competition, which, by the way, small business owners out there, I'd be thinking about this one really, really hard. It's a, it's a yeah. tremendous opportunity to set for up sure. a little quick. Well, yeah, what would happen if you'd have gotten into the convenience store business 50 years ago with a gas station? Or what would have happened if you'd have bought one of the early licenses for uh, for cell phone towers? Or what would happen if you'd have bought one of the early licenses for um, uh, a, a cable TV? Or billboards I mean, those or people whatever. Those people did yeah. very well. Yeah. yeah. That infrastructure got not All the early entrepreneurs got in. They sold and they made a ton of money, right? Well, that's like, that's the game again, folks. Like it's sitting there as obvious as can be. And that one company that had a chance to squeeze you by the neck just walked away. So I think it's bad for the Tesla people, yeah. but it's great for the entrepreneurs. It definitely is. And I think it's a testament to, uh, you know, we talk to a lot of business owners that have small, medium sized businesses and they, you know, they wonder, well, you know, how can learning about Tesla and Walmart and Walgreens help my business? And the, the answer is that the decisions are still being made. There's more zeros that they're dealing with. But it's the same kind of decisions, the same framework, the same foundation, the same uh, process. And, um, you know, I've got we get uh, a lot of accolades from uh, successful people, too, that have heard our podcast and said, you know, listen, that was very interesting. And I, I thought about doing something. I created a blank space team. I've been experimenting with these things. And we like to hear your accolades. So send us an email at Manny at SparkPartners.com or Adam at SparkPartners.com. And uh, we'd mm -hmm. love to talk about your story. And with that, any final thoughts, Adam, before we uh, sign off? Well, it's been a wide-ranging discussion, and I, I hope we can we didn't lose our listeners out there. But the biggest thing about this discussion was starting off with the notion that strategic planning isn't an annual exercise. It's not about creating something that you look at once a year. It's a continuous process. It starts with scenario development, and then you constantly updating your scenario, constantly discussing what that future looks like so that, in fact, your all of your decision-making process is driven by your strategy. So it's a continuous strategic process because it's part of your continuous decision-making. And then once you get that built into your system, 
then how do you be careful about your innovation, right? And what we want to do is we want to innovate for that future, be ready to go forward to meet that future, and again, resource ourselves in a way so that each step falls behind the other, heading us in the direction of reaching out to that future scenario. So if you're, if you're out there paying attention to trends and building your scenarios, the opportunities will come. And if you try to run your business from the hip, uh, I don't Not think you have happen. much of a chance. Very well said, Adam. With that, we'll sign off for today. Uh, we'll talk to you later. Thank you.